It's official. Mark Chaikin just went live with the biggest prediction of his career. A new wave of volatility is coming for the stock market and investors need to act immediately. Mark's prediction is based on an indicator that has only triggered a handful of times in the last 72 years, with a 100% success rate for predicting where stocks will go next. During Mark's 50-year career, he's worked alongside some of the biggest investors in history, including Paul Tudor Jones and Michael Steinhardt. In fact, Mark invented one of Wall Street's most popular indicators for picking stocks, still used by hedge funds, banks, and brokerage sites, and today found in every Bloomberg terminal on the planet. Now, Mark's inviting you to watch his brand new event as he explains exactly what the next wave of volatility will look like and where it will send stocks in the coming weeks. He's even sharing one of his favorite ideas free for those who tune in. He says this idea could create bigger gains than anything he's used his power gauge system for until now by turning the coming market volatility to your advantage. But Mark says you must act today before volatility hits the market. To watch his newest prediction in full, go to shakenevent.com. That's shakenevent.com. Hi, this is Daniela Camboni. Welcome back to the Daniela Camboni Show on the road here in Zurich, Switzerland. And with my next guest, Frank Holmes of U.S. Global Investors. Frank, how special is this? Spectacular. Just right? a little il faut foie. Um, <laughs> but anything for the shot. We are absolutely freezing. I am in open toe sandals, but we will power through. Uh, no shortage of news here, Frank. We were saying, you know, things are just moving at lightning speed here. First, I'm, I, you know, look. We're, we're in the belly of the beast. I want to get your take on what I call the bank sprint, not the bank run, by how fast things are unfolding and banks are collapsing. I mean, how far do the dominoes go here? But it's, you know, it's interesting because it's very different than 2008. The rising of rates seems to be a magic number. And as soon as rates went above 4%, wealthy people and corporations started taking their money out of all these banks and putting them into money funds. But it wasn't, wasn't until it went above 4% that it accelerated. And the portfolios on the other side were mismatched, that they had long bonds versus short, and they couldn't me right. meet all the redemptions. Nobody expected such a zero, uh, everything melts. Uh, ice freezes, well, this melted. But, and you know, offline, I know, Frank, we were, we were scratching our heads saying, you know, where was the risk management? I mean, what really went wrong? How could they have become so sloppy? Uh, I think it just has to do with mismatch. Uh, when you have a bond portfolio, either you ladder it. Yeah. If you had $10 million and you'd have a million dollars for each of the 10 years, uh, or you barbell it yeah. and you put $5 million out for 10 years and $5 million for one year, but then you have to make hardcore decisions if rates are rising across the spectrum. And a lot of portfolio managers are reluctant they are just, they just don't, they're not comfortable, but they were, it appears to be barbelling their portfolios and they didn't move fast enough. And then 4%, boom, money left. Do you mind sharing the story because you were affected by Signature Bank? Yeah, well, Signature Bank was such a shock uh, because yes, uh, we had a million seven there, yeah. but you know, they moved it out. Uh, it was all good. Uh, it, it was, it was, it was professional. It was all done. But I, I really think that, um, it was a shock for even Bernie Frank was on the board that said on Friday, everything was okay. And over the weekend, everything was not. And they shut it down because they were very successful and had a small component of their business was in crypto. Exactly. So let's bring up that angle because people are saying this was really, you know, the U.S. situation, a crackdown on crypto. Do you buy that narrative? I do. I do. And, and in particular, New York State. Uh, New York State has a lot of, like we have here, the Greenpeace was here. Well, yes, at the conference. Yes. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and you have climate change, yeah. a very wealthy climate change fanatics. And they've pushed for legislation to shut down any form of mining right. in the state, even if you have a private source of electricity, you have your own hydro dam, it doesn't matter. Uh, and so, yes, and, and Signature Bank was a New York State bank. So it's really tragic what happened to the shareholders there because I know from the relationship we had, it was first class people, first class operation. The due diligence process that we had to go through all the time was at this level. Right. So it is, it's just part of this whole narrative. I, I, and the bank 
wants to come out. Like the, all these yeah. countries, like now the, the Bitcoin's coming out, uh, they all want to come out with their own currency yes. because Bitcoin validated the blockchain. What's really important is that the blockchain was created in 91 by Americans. And then we go another decade further and it was released as the SHA-256, which is the encryption used for your iPhone for facial recognition, yeah. also used for Bitcoin. And then nine years later it comes out Bitcoin because it was the amalgamation of the two and it's American innovation. So I believe there's a Japanese uh, founder, but really it's just another name. Uh, it's an American creation. It was a defense department, uh, DARPA, uh, the U.S. government, that created SHA-256. You know what I find fascinating about you, Frank? You're always learning. I know you just came back from Harvard where you took a course on digital transformation. And I say you, you're unique to this space because you are involved in crypto via Hive, but you're also a huge name in the precious metal space. But you've embraced both. And I know you're trying to bring the innovation of crypto to precious metals. You almost want to tell these miners, wake up, you got to change. This yeah. industry has to change. What are the lessons that can be learned from crypto? Probably the easiest is board uh, a yacht club. Uh, they can go to YouTube and learn about it, but how they created a, a club and a fraternity that that original 10,000 uh, animations done with AI of, a, of an ape uh, it went out at $200 and a year later, yeah. all the additions were with 600,000. So it created a culture, it created a club, and the only way you could get onto the Zoom, the Discord look and talk to other people is if you were a member and you had to own the art. So it's a cultural phenomenon. And that's what I, when I first got into, curious about this business in 2017, I go to a conference in New York and the keynote speaker is a CEO of Fidelity. And she doesn't speak at investment conference and she's talking about Bitcoin. And the biggest booth was IBM. I said, well, something big is happening in blockchain and people spend $1,000 a ticket to get in. Uh, then there's 30,000 people spent this in Miami. They're in Barcelona three weeks ago. Uh, it's in England. So the, the ecosystem for Bitcoin, there's 12,000 independent nodes around the world validating transactions. So it's a really interesting group of people that want to have this mechanism that's released all this other innovation. But I really looked at it as being, I have an asset class and you have a diversified portfolio. I've always advocating of a 10% weighting in gold, just like Ray Dalio at Bridgewater. He always has for his parity trading some gold. And, and along comes this Bitcoin and the gold bugs are telling me about it. And I said, you know, that's interesting, a, 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 an asset class right. with maybe 3%, a jalapeno, but you can't eat a plate of jalapenos. But the diehards, the advocates, the really hardcore, yeah. they're only long Bitcoin. Let me ask you this, as an operator in the space, how concerned are you of coming regulation or do you see it as a positive? Well, I think it could be a positive, but it concerns you when they shut down banks the way they did Signature uh, and, and how that took place. So that does create a concern. Uh, and, and how I saw in Canada, the accounting board uh, was used as a weapon to go after any of them was crypto, not to get auditors. You, you have to support getting auditors to actually chase away crooks like Sam Bankman. Uh, you, you have to have lots of auditors and make it easy and auditors not to be attacked by the audit committee. Just uh, you know, shifting gears here, I want to get your thoughts on uh, China, Russia. I know you've been doing a lot of uh, talking and, and reports on this. Your take on if we could see the emergence or growing uh, stance of the petrol yuan here. Yes, and, and, uh, and I've been chatting about that for since December when it became quite clear. Uh, the other sort of theory that you have to have on game theory is the Chinese have a longer vision. And, and, and China, the, when you come to laws of physics, by the way, force equals MA. So what is a force? It's the mass that's accelerating. And it could be your GDP, it could be your military, it could be a billion people. That's a lot of mass. So China in the past 20 years, the GDP is the same as Russia, but it's GDP per capita, mm -hmm. per person, but the GDP of that nation is now $18 billion. Russia is only 1.8 billion. America is 23 billion. So it makes it very difficult for America to really take on China and Russia 
at the same time because you start seeing the sheer numbers of their mass of, of GDP. So what's happened, I believe, is that China pushes Russia to go ahead and go back into Ukraine. Right. And if Russia loses, then they're going to go and take Manchuria and up as much as Siberia to get more land. And if Russia wins uh, in the Ukraine war, then they take out Taiwan and you've got a, the top selling book, the chip wars. So it's a great concern and America is now spending billions of dollars sponsoring chip manufacturing, the high quality chips in Taiwan to move to be manufactured in the U.S. So we have for the first time in history an interesting black swan and because America's wars. two cold wars. <laughs> two cold wars. Two. But, you know, how do you think America's looking at this? I mean, they're, they're obviously seeing all this unfold. I mean, we're shooting down spy balloons. Is it to just further the narrative that China is the enemy, like enemy number one now? What's behind that? I don't know, but I do know that, that China got, went anti-Bitcoin because they're coming out with their own digital currency. Uh, and what you have to be worried about is that digital currency, had a, if you didn't spend the money, it would be vaporized. You, you lost it. So they really want to control society. Yeah. Uh, and so now we get this anti-narrative in the U.S. Is it because the Treasury wants to come up with their own uh, currency? Yeah. Well, that's what it looks like. I yes, mean, it seems like we're fast-tracking uh, central bank digital currencies in the U.S. now. And, and, and now you've got the governor running for president from uh, uh, Florida. Yeah, DeSantis. Uh, DeSantis, and he's coming out to, he doesn't want it because right. there'll be infringement right. on your rights. So the whole idea of gold, gold is a decentralized asset. Right. And Bitcoin is just a digital asset, it's decentralized. And I just believe that you should have a small component in a portfolio and rebalance it. And year to date, with all this calamity, all the negative attack of Bitcoin, Bitcoin's jumped 70%. Yeah. So gold's up, uh, what, 18, 19%, but nothing compared to, um, sorry, no, the NASDAQ is, it's had a bounce here. But I, I think that this, talking about the big picture that's good news, is that since I was born, yes. in the third year of the president's term, the market's up 90 some odd percent of the time, and it's up between 13 if it's a Democrat and 17 percent if it's a Republican president in the third year. So we are in the third year, and you see the Jets, our Jets ETF, it's flying above the S&P. It's outperforming the S&P. The PMIs for, because China's opened its economy, they've now gone global PMIs above 50. So I think, you know, the year, don't get caught up so much in the negative narrative right. that it could be if you're not long, you're wrong. Uh, that's a good point you're bringing up. And anyone that knows you uh, personally knows that you're a big believer in, you know, positive thinking and, you know, with all these negative headlines circulating us, a lot of investors write to me, email me daily, so concerned, frightened for the future. How do you navigate it? How can you keep your head above water here? How do you stay positive? Well, there's lots of spiritual and, and uh, elements uh, and, and religion is important and meditation is very important and the circle of friends you have. Uh, in, in, in the study of chemistry, I was going into medicine, uh, you have uh, either an exothermic or endothermic reaction. You need a catalyst. Is someone giving you energy or take your energy? So when I meet people that all of a sudden I walk away, I felt they took all my energy. <laughs> I have to get them out of my life. I have to find someone that's going to be giving me energy uh, that's positive and constructive. And then I have them blessed at the age of 60 having a little baby girl. And so Beautiful now girl. I'm you know, 68 and running uh, and, and I'm blessed. Yeah. So I think staying young that way is, yeah. is, is important. Uh, also, MIT did research on this, that those that look positively about it, what's good about America, and I think there's some great lines here, that America's only 5% of the world's GDP, sorry, 5% 5, 5 of the world's population, but 25% of the world's GDP, but almost 60% of the world's public market cap. So we must be doing something right, and if you want to yeah. bet, you're going to bet on America because they'll have a big debate and punch out uh, yeah. that they'll come out to a good decision and I'm going to bet that the year ends up uh, based on uh, what 75 years of data. All right. Let's see how it unfolds and I'm sending positive energy your way and shout out to Frank's baby girl Sarah if she's watching. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you Frank. Try and enjoy some uh, downtime here in Zurich. And thank you all for watching. We'll have much more coverage coming your way so be sure to stay tuned and sign up at DaniellaComboni.com to stay on top of it all. That's it for me for now.
Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.